Hello there. Here I am again. Indeed, I have been here every day for the last two weeks and will carry on just in case uh, somebody feels the need for a chat. And the only thing that's stopping us is that I don't actually know you. Uh, if you are on your own, you may need a little diversion. If you're with someone, well, you may need, I don't know, you may need a little time on your own. Uh, stories are one of the best escapes that I know. I have no idea when telling tales began, but I rather imagine even in the Stone Age, folks sat around the fire spinning yarns about the bison which got away. So today, I thought I would tell you the story about just one person, Lady Houston. Uh, the only problem is that I will never have enough time to cover her dazzling life. She was a true eccentric who was once described as someone who provided a welcome break in the monotony of mass-produced humanity. A remarkable woman who I expect most people have never heard of, but whose story is an inspiration to those of us who believe that whatever time we have ought to be lived to the full. So she flew across my horizon today because April the 3rd is the anniversary in 1933 of the very first ever flight over Mount Everest. So what, you will say, has that got to do with Lady Houston? Well, she paid for the expedition and the long-term result was that Britain ended up with the Spitfire aeroplane and you probably don't need a history lesson from me about why that was a good thing. But before we get to the point where a two-seater biplane known as the Westland Wallace dared to soar over the highest mount on the planet, we need to go back a bit. Uh, back to Lambeth in South London near the Oval Cricket Ground and back to the year 1857 when Fanny Lucy Radmill was born into Victorian poverty. She was the ninth of ten children born to Thomas and Maria Radmill. Now you would think that with that many siblings, it would be hard to have your voice heard. But Fanny would grow up to be the toast of Edwardian society and the richest woman in Britain. Every photograph of the time shows that she was a beauty. And by the time she was 16, she was making the most of her good looks as a chorus girl called Poppy in the London theatre. Well, it wasn't long before she attracted the attention of what used to be known as stage door Johnnies, the men who hung around trying to date chorus girls. And before long, she ran off with the already married brewer Frederick Gretton of the Bass Beer family. I don't know what Mrs. Gretton thought about it, but Fred and Poppy eloped to Paris, where they lived a high life in sin for 10 years. So the English hoi polloi mostly thought that they were a disgrace. But you know, the French have a different view of these things and took the couple to their hearts. Poppy is described as being a beautiful young coquette with impudent speech and a tiny waist who became expert in Parisian fashion and manners. She learned to speak French. She made friends with, the Edward, uh, with Edward, Prince of Wales, you know, who was also hanging out in Paris. Uh, very sadly, Poppy's beau Fred died, but not before he had bequeathed her £6,000 a year for life. So it may not sound like a huge amount, uh, but when you remember this was 1882, then you have to understand that's about three quarters of a million pounds in today's money. She was set for life. She returned to London as a sensation. She was wined and dined at all the top places and never went to a restaurant without knowing the colour of the decor so that her dress would not clash with the setting. She married again and then again, each time to society men. She became Lady Byron and as such became an ardent patriot. Uh, during the First World War, she did what she could for the war effort. She sent out footballs as well as matches to soldiers serving overseas in boxes labelled a match for our matchless troops from Lady Byron and ran a very successful campaign entitled Give Him Socks. Later, she opened a rest home for nurses who had served on the Western Front. And because of this, uh, Poppy was made a dame in her own right in 1917. She became an active suffragette. Uh, she not only used her money for the cause, standing bail, in fact, at one point for Emily and Pankhurst, uh, but she was not averse to getting into the fray in her own mm, unique style. She would drive to Hampstead Heath in her carriage, stand up in it when she got there to harangue visitors in getting them to write to their MPs to demand justice for women. At the death of her third and indeed final husband, Sir Robert Patterson Houston, in 1926, left her the richest woman in the country. And she used the money well. Indeed, had she not done so, the fate of Britain in World War II would have been quite different. So everybody who knows anything about that war knows 
how significant the Spitfire aircraft was. Uh, the predecessor to that aircraft was a single-engined racing seaplane known as the Supermarine S6. The design team were determined to create a high-speed aircraft which could transform the RAF, which up until then had just had those slow biplanes. Uh, when the Great Depression in 1931 happened, the government of Ramsay MacDonald pulled the plug on financing the ongoing aviation research. Poppy was appalled. She saw aviation as key to the future defence of Britain. So that year, that particular plane had been due to take part in the prestigious Schneider Trophy, which was a trophy awarded to the world's fastest seaplane. Poppy was determined that Britain would not be left out, so she donated £100,000. That's about three and a half million pounds in today's money uh, to keep the work going and the plane and indeed the RAF crew flying it claimed victory. It was a move which would transform Britain's air defence. The design team gained the experience in producing high-speed aircraft without which they would never have been ready to fight off the Luftwaffe in 1940. When World War II ended and Winston Churchill made his famous speech honouring the few who had saved the country, Poppy was one of them. But I wonder how many people knew that. Poppy continued her support of aviation development when she funded that flight over Mount Everest. It was a milestone in flight history. Even the Nepalese government recognised her generosity. A heart-shaped lake spotted from the air 6,000 feet below the summit of Mount Everest was named by Nepal's government the Lady of the Mountain in her honour. Politicians, especially Labour ones, infuriated her. She published her own newspaper, the Saturday Review, so that she could say what she liked about the government. And when Ramsay MacDonald's government refused her offer of £200,000 to strengthen the British Army and Navy, she hung a huge electric sign decrying the Prime Minister in the rigging of her yacht and sailed it round Great Britain. Although she died in 1936, her health regime sounds remarkably modern. She renounced tea, coffee, butter, bacon, meat, white bread and pastry, all alcoholic drinks and salt. I mean, it sounds dull to me, but she was certain it was the key to her health. She was obsessed with fresh air and sunshine, claiming that being nude in the open air had what she called prophetic powers, which were almost religious. On board her yacht, which was named Liberty, she would order the crew to go below so that she could promenade naked on deck. Now, on reflection, uh, she held some mm, right of centre views, which I would have been appalled by, but perhaps I have historical hindsight. In her day, she was dazzling and daring, an activist and aviation pioneer, a philanthropist, and above all, a passionate human being. When her old friend Edward VII abdicated the British throne, she was devastated. She took to her bed, refused to eat, and aged 79 passed away from a heart attack. Was she a bit mad? Absolutely. I love that. Live life to the full. Do what you can to make the world a better place. And above all, be unpredictable. You know, we could all do with more people like Poppy. Take care. Be kind. 